Somebody give me sa yes. Okay, uh, let's start. Belated, but start. Uh, I'll be a bit faster then. Okay, I'm talking today about the Type C plug and USB 3.1, and uh, uh, the main part will be indeed the Type C connector because USB 3.1 is boring. It's just a minor revision, basically faster, nothing more. Um, so the Type C connector is, well, it's a connector, but why another connector? Firstly, it's faster, and faster is always better. It's smaller, smaller than a conventional USB connector, not really smaller than a, a micro USB connector, but uh, its main feature is its versatility. Uh, it can do more than just USB, uh, and that is the reason people like it. It can do power, and it can do other things, and it can do a lot of power. The obvious plan of that company, uh, which uh, makes a lot of products whose name starts with an I, is more or less to make uh, a universal connector. So, what can it do? Faster USB? Twice as much? It provides these things called the alternate modes. This is, we run something else than USB over the connector. It also provides uh, support for something which is called an accessory, which is another way to run something else about the connector, in this case mainly sound. It's just cheaper. Again, a feature incorporated for the company whose products start with I. And you can put a lot of power over it. In fact, 100 watts at the maximum. So it is also designed to unify and get rid of power connectors. It uses uh, three main technologies for that. The Type-C connector itself, uh, USB 3.1, which is interwoven in the specification in a rather complicated manner and a USB power delivery, which is not strictly speaking limited to the Type-C connector, but in practice is, and is indispensable for the operation of the connector in alternate modes. For USB, it works without. What does the con uh, connector do? Uh, it uh, gets you a lot of data lines different kinds of data lines, USB 3 and faster and USB 2 are physically separated. It gets you um, some uh, pins dedicated to alternate modes and it gets you a very diverse power supply. There is a power supply for the bus itself and one for the cable, because the cables uh, become actually active components under type C uh, for most use cases. You can build a conventional cable out of copper which is connected through and it will work for USB and maybe alternate modes if it's very short, but that's it. So under type C, uh, the cables themselves become gadgets and can be talked to in quite a bewildering manner of um, ways. This connector is quite flexible. It can switch almost everything, again, optionally. You can switch the communication mode, you can switch the mode in the sense of the alternate modes, the protocol you run over this thing, and it can switch the, the way you supply power in it. And uh, during all this switching, it uh, still retains a minimum USB 2.0 connection. Um, USB, as you, I hope, know, is a strict master and slave protocol. That property is retained. Uh, there is just a, manner, a, a method to uh, switch between master and slave on the fly. And the master uh, is also that part of the connection which uh, decides uh, which mode is to be run over the connector. Uh, the, the, slave, uh, the slave says what it can do, and the master selects and also has to, to make sure that uh, the cable actually can do what it is required to do. 
Uh, in the power supply mode, uh, under USB, it is clearly defined. The, the master provides the energy, and the slave, if it wants it, can take it. If not, then it has to provide its own energy, and the master, in every case, has to provide its energy. Uh, under the Type-C connector, and this is independent of USB, uh, those roles can be meant, uh, switched over, so it is possible to power a laptop, let's say, from the monitor. Uh, let's get to USB 3.0, uh, 3.1, I'm sorry, because it can be quickly done. The raw speed, it's doubled, and that's it. Um, the uh, Type-C connector is not limited to USB 3.1 super speed, but super speed is limited to the Type-C connector. So if you want the full 10 gigabits per second, you need a Type-C connector. In other features, it provides a bit more of what we already have. There is one major uh, new thing, but that I can't cover because it's too new and has too many implications, that is authentication. You can check that the device is actually what it claims to be. But uh, I won't touch that now. Um, to be noted is that master and slave are still distinct. So USB is obviously not peer-to-peer, -peer, but it would be possible or thinkable to have a device to be master and slave at the same time. But know that it's not how it works. You can exchange the roles, but it only has one role at a time. The main technology and the most troublesome part uh, of the standard is actually USB power delivery, which technically is not limited to a Type-C connector. It is defined for the usual AB connector, but deprecated. So in practice, I doubt we'll see it. And it is not limited to USB. It is also used for power bricks, and if they are to um, deliver more than 15 watts, it's not just uh, available, it's then mandatory. If you use it and are ready to ramp up the voltage, then your limit is 100 watts. If you do the math, that's 5 amps. If the cable does it, but we'll come to that. So, it is also used in those famous alternate modes, which I will come to. So it's, but let's explain, one of those alternate modes is DisplayPort. So you can run the DisplayPort protocol over a Type-C cable, and still use the power brick of your monitor as the source of your uh, power supply for your system. And then uh, uh, the monitor and the system must negotiate what's called the power contract, so that the monitor can probably uh, properly uh, budget its power and share it out, because the monitor might also contain a USB hub or something, which then would also be driven. If you use it for USB, the power budgeting goes down the whole tree over the hubs. If you use the alternate modes, that's not the case, with the one exception of USB bridging, which allows you to run a subset of the power delivery protocol to the next level in a hub. But uh, we'll come to that. Um, the hubs, uh, and that's the nice one about the protocol, you can ignore the feature. Then the hubs are on their own and must implement a limited uh, amount of power budgeting. And if you don't like that, you can switch the hubs uh, to the fully dependent mode and then every request is rerouted to the host and it has full control over the power uh, budget in the system as a whole. <coughs> How does it work? The power delivery thing uh, on a technical level is most similar actually to a very primitive ethernet. 
it's implemented technically as a frequency modulation on top of either the power supply or a control cable, so it's arcane. It is, in contrast to USB, a, a truly peer-to-peer -peer thing. From the protocol, every partner on that wire can talk to the other one. And there is, at a maximum, actually four partners on each connection. Yes, it is point-to-point, -point, but one partner is the host, the second is the device, and this is not a joke, both ends of the cable which results in a maximum of four partners, yes. Um, each command is uh, immediately replied to in a, a, an uh, acknowledgement, which just means understood, there's a CFC involved. And uh, the graphics I showed you was more or less the most simple exchange. There is a command and a response. Um, the understood message has a very tight time limit, 15 milliseconds, so we absolutely cannot do that in user space, uh, because the failure to meet that time response leads into the error handling and this has very serious consequences, we don't want that. So this is either in kernel space or in many implementations we have a part of the power delivery protocol uh, in firmware on an ACPI embedded controller or something similar. Um, <clears throat> that is something we have to keep in mind when we come to the, the API we can make. Uh, but uh, let's go to this uh, later. Um, there is, for the API design, a further um, a thing that we have to keep in mind. The response is usually yes, no, or later. Yes and no are rather obvious. The later part allows us to make a callback from the kernel into user space and let user space set a policy, or to delay the kernel's action until user space has set a, a, a limit uh, or a policy. What does USB power delivery do? It defines ways of controlling how power is distributed and delivered. Uh, one of the features is that we can go over the five volts. A USB um, C cable is in every case limited to five amps. So if you do, do the math, if you stay at five volts, you arrive at 25 watts. And if you ramp it up all the way to the uh, maximum allowed voltage of 20 volt, you arrive at a whopping 100 watts. Uh, the actual selection is done by finding the, uh, well, greatest common denominator between uh, the host and the device, where both uh, sides advertise what they can do, and the actual choice is done on the device side and the host then has the choice between um, taking the offer or rejecting it and then start new negotiations or to let it fail. It is also used um, for switching the data roles on the Type-C cable. So you have to implement USB power delivery even in for that most basic feature beyond the simple faster connection and the cryptography. Um, the authentication is again not limited to USB. It can be done also in the alternate modes and indeed in theory you can authenticate that your power brick is indeed your power brick uh, for whatever that may be useful. Uh, I have no idea, but it's possible. And believe it or not, you can use USB power delivery to update the firmware of your power brick. Yep, it, <laughs> but still, in fact, you can update the firmware of a cable. Um, yes, sorry, but that's the spec. Um, 
power delivery is also used to enter and leave the alternate modes. It also does the not so hard part of the error handling and it's used to ask the cable about its capabilities, which is how much power can you deliver, uh, which alternate modes do you support. Um, this is not actually so trivial because the spec also defines now optical cables for USB, so we need to know that. A power delivery has the main function of, well, not main, but according to its name, function of providing power. Uh, power management uh, with a Type-C connector is different from power management with earlier USB. In our runtime power management with earlier USB, we are con uh, con um, concerned with conserving power. It's good if we can uh, save power, but still the system has to work without it. Uh, with Type-C, if you get all your power over a Type-C connector, you can obviously not deliver the same amount of power over more than one Type-C connector. In fact, as you yourself will consume some power, you can't even deliver the same amount of power. Or if you don't go to the highest voltage, uh, your laptop is not going to provide, uh, say we have six ports, and each is supposed to provide 15 watts, not in battery mode, I'm sorry, not going to happen. So uh, we negotiate what is called the power contract between the master and the slave, which uh, again um, <clears throat> is done by uh, comparing offers and letting the slave decide on which to select and the master decide on whether to take this or start some new connection, uh, negotiation. The master must be sure that uh, its commitments do not um, exceed its capabilities, which would be trivial except for uh, one uh, additional complication. A USB power delivery device uh, can express its maximum energy need and its current energy needs which means that it's in principle possible to overcommit power and manage this on the fly. This is uh, a feature the host must uh, negotiate, uh, must um, guarantee or leave to the hubs in case of hubs, but it has very serious consequences for the architecture if we decide to use this feature. We of obviously, it can decide not to do overcommit, but then we risk uh, that our devices won't run because we can't meet the combined uh, maximum power limit. They also can say we pro use this much power at the present, but we are able to rapidly uh, decrease our power needs. This is intended for devices which are charging their internal batteries uh, from power delivery. And this feature can be used in kernel space and in user space uh, to uh, power down some devices to meet the power consumption of another device if it goes into peak mode. Uh, the policy for that is a bit involved. So, alternate modes. And this is... Um, in my opinion, and probably most people's opinion, the killer feature of the Type-C connector. Uh, this is designed to provide a universal connector. We've seen it does faster USB, which is good, but wouldn't be a sensation. It can be used to, to get rid of, of proprietary power plugs, also nice, not a sensation. I think in the long run, we will see that we will, that most connector types other than the type C will die. Because it's rather expensive to develop something which is hot, pluggable, fast, durable, and so on. So there has to be a reason for somebody to spend that much money. And it has to provide an additional benefit. 
if you can run your protocol over the type C connector, then I guess there's no much point in that. So if I have to make a prediction now, uh, and I'm going to do so voluntarily, I'd say type C will survive, type A will survive because it's much cheaper and nobody really cares about his mouse, it's got to work, no, no reason to do fancy power delivery or so. Uh, I guess the, the Ethernet connector will also survive and probably the Express card connector. But beyond that, I'm actually skeptical. Anyway, so which are protocols are um, defined? For now, DisplayPort, uh, Thunderbolt, PCI and MHL. MHL is actually, uh, and don't be uh, disappointed, I had to look that, that up myself, is a video protocol which more or less ends up in HDMI. Uh, it's for used to connect uh, mobile phones to TV sets, but okay. So, <clears throat> the physical protocol is run over the wires in the cable. They can be switched. There is an actual multiplexer uh, in the Type-C assembly on your motherboard, which allows you to physically reroute the cable or parts of it. So, you get a direct connection from, let's say, your GPU or your Thunderbolt connector to the other side of the Type-C cable. And how this is controlled, I will come to in a moment. So, um, it is not in all cases defined to have a Type-C connector for this. It is defined now for Thunderbolt 3, where it is mandatory, and it is defined for DisplayPort. For the other cases, we have what we are uh, calling the alternate mode adapter which is kind of a type C to something else cable, like a real display port or, or an, an older Thunderbolt. A Thunderbolt. Uh, so we have this kind of cable where we are talking to the plug instead of the device with the USB power delivery. <coughs> Let's see how I'm on time. Okay. Uh, on the architecture level, we have more or less decided to see the type C thing as a bus. As a bus without I.O. And what we use it for is more or less the hot plugging and the interrupt and error handling capability and the power management capability of a real bus in the device model. So, if you switch uh, your uh, port to an alternate mode, let's say display port, you will get an, a real kernel hot plug event for your now display port monitor. So, how do we control this goodness? There is basically an infinite uh, amount of possibilities which doesn't make it good. So, uh, the easiest thing would be to use ACPI. There is a standard called the UCSI, which allows us to, to use most, but not all features of uh, <coughs> the power delivery protocol. Then there is, uh, we can go to the really defined uh, bare bones of the hardware, which is an I2C bus, which connects all the ports to one master controller, has defined commands and so on. Uh, the problem here is if we do the voltage selection wrong, then we have a real problem. Um, devices are supposed to withstand 20 volts, but I am quite reluctant to put this theory to the test. And the few type C drivers we have actually seen, besides UCSI, uh, are unfortunately of yet another kind. They are a mixture of uh, additional uh, vendor-specific registers on XHCI controllers and platform devices. And okay, not good, but we will probably end up with a half a dozen or so at a minimum. Uh, type C drivers which will plug into and into the kernel 
into uh, the generic layer. Okay, then uh, let's see in the kernel, what do we have? Okay, the good news, USB 3.1 is finished. There are bugs left, obviously, and it's not quite so stable, but it's there, it works, the user space support is also there, done. Great big, cool. Um, that is good, but not interesting. So, the Type-C connector itself. We have the UCSI driver. I hope and presume that Intel has tested it, but uh, nobody obviously without a firmware can test it, so shit. Um, it does the basic job and that's it. TCPM, yeah, we will have to do this, uh, but this is going to take some discussion. Uh, there is a generic type C bus type, which is in the kernel. There's the plug in to uh, the individual drivers, which at least for what Intel has now is working. And there is an, uh, an API to user space for using this whole stuff. <clears throat> so, what possibilities do we have? We have now decided to split the alternate mode and the power delivery stuff in the narrow sense in two and to implement only the, um, the mode selection and the data role selection and so on uh, under the type C bus because this is a split that is more or less forced upon us by the UCSI driver. That's how it works. And if we are going to see um, uh, power delivery in the narrow sense being implemented in microcontrollers, we cannot put this into uh, this directory. And uh, frankly, uh, we are not at the point where we could set an API for this in stone. So we don't do it. Power delivery is quite hard because on the one hand, it has got nothing to do with USB. And on the other hand, it is implemented in USB because the hubs do it. So we are facing the ugly choice here of implementing it more or less with two APIs. That is implementing it in the root hub as an emulation like we do for, for root hubs in USB in general or to do something else. So any input here is appreciated, but I must say we are even now uh, discussing the final touches of the alternate mode API, so power delivery API will have to wait. Um, it also uh, imposes on us uh, a policy problem. Uh, there are several ways to, to get more power for our system. We can obviously request more from our power source, if that is power delivery, we can tell devices to use less power, or if this is a peak load, we can even wait and hope that the second peak load won't be necessary until the first peak load goes away. And if that's not the case, wait for it to pass. So this needs to be implemented. I talked in the beginning about accessories, and we've decided to leave this to Alsa. I see a head shaking there. <laughs> uh, could have thought so. Anyway, there is also a debug accessory, which is quite ill-defined. No idea. These are basically clutches invented for the company whose name I don't use here, so they can make very cheap headphones for for their, their phones. But, it's part of the standard. So, our API. What do we have? Nothing. In the sense that of what is in the kernel. Then there is a really big nothing. We have an API draft which is almost finished and could go into 4.8. 
which is an API for the alternate modes, uh, the mode switching and so on. That is working. Uh, for now, it looks like we are going with this split of the APIs. Uh, if somebody wants something else, he should speak up this week or it's too late more or less. We have not yet decided how we do the other way around. That is not tell the kernel to th do things, but to be notified from the kernel about what's happening. What's happening on the bus is errors and the bus has a virtual, in principle, even vectored uh, interrupt capability. Uh, in that case, we've not even decided whether we should export this to user space. The current thinking is no, we should not. Um, the same thing goes about resets. So, but we do have a lot of things which are more or less decided. Uh, and the whole thing is to be built in SysFS. If we can avoid it, there will, won't be an alternate modes tool or a, a USB PD tool. If at all possible, we are going to leave this in user space. And if we are going to write such a tool, it's strictly for convenience, not really necessary. <clears throat> We're going to uh, export this as directories per port with a lot of uh, subdirectories, uh, which will uh, listen the uh, list the uh, the uh, available uh, modes, the attributes, and so on, and the power delivery attributes. We've also decided, and this is a bit problematic in the graphics case, that an alternate mode will in every case need a kernel driver which is responsible for power management, error handling and hot plug. That means that we have to uh, find a way to get at least hot plug events from, for monitors uh, from this driver into the graphics drivers. That much is clear. What is also not set, it, set in stone is the problem with the booting. Uh, we as a distribution probably want to be a master, but that's not something we can put into the generic kernel. At the same time, uh, USB ports have to be enumerated before we load the init RD, at least in potential. This is possible. You can statically compile the USB core module, and that's a feature that's going to stay. Uh, so we need to, uh, to express to the kernel at that stage, uh, uh, what do we prefer? Do we want to be a master if we can't do, or do we insist on being a master and reject the, the other side if it also uh, insists on being a master? Uh, these are possibilities which we need to express, and this probably means we are going to introduce module parameters, which is not nice, but I see no other option. We are also missing a good deal of stuff in user space. Uh, the obvious thing is GUIs. Uh, there are, is the possibility that we want to deviate from the de default in the data role or uh, in uh, the alternate mode. That needs a user interface. And we as a distro, how am I in time? Okay, well, this, will uh, be faced with the fact that we will end up as a slave in some t uh, uh, places, because people will insist on linking their laptops with Type-C cables and then somebody has to be the slave. We need to do something sensible in that case. That's not yet decided, but not a question for upstream rather than for the distros. In the alternate modes, uh, devices are more or less called for, actually required, but we've seen requirements to implement a small rudimentary USB 2.0 device which is capable of telling the host what it wants to be in terms of, of alternate mode. 
and uh, we need to implement a driver for this. Until recently, uh, we wanted to have this handled by UDEF and the GUI. Uh, considerations about the boot process put this into doubt. We might actually need a kernel driver for this. And obviously we need still, in addition, UDEF rules. The problem here is again graphics. Uh, I will come to that. And we have to come to the fact that uh, we will uh, sometimes end up as not uh, the power provider, but the power sink. And then we might be asked to give back power or to ne renegotiate our power contract. We need uh, some user space component for this. This is asking too much of our kernel. In addition, we need a, a power budgeting mechanism. We can decide to not overcommit, but I doubt in the long run this is viable. So we need uh, first something in the kernel which implements this, and then something in user space which uh, decides the policy for this. And even worse, we need if we, for example, are to give back power, we need a way uh, to um, switch off charging the battery. So we need uh, power limiters and budgeters from other uh, parts in the kernel integrated in this power budgeting uh, demon thingy, controller, however we call it. And there is something worse. We are talking about um, Thunderbolt here and PCI and USB 2, in the case of the storage thing, are parts of the block layer. Now, I know many people here would like to see power limiting only be done in user space. The problem with this is it is, in principle, impossible. This is not even a question of system design. It is a feature of using virtual memory. You cannot do this you will inevitably deadlock, uh, because time is short. Uh, is here anybody who insists on a full explanation of why this is impossible? Okay, so the actual implementation will have to look something like this. Um, and we need Furthermore, to come up with a sensible boot process, because there is a problem. If display port really dies as a connector, we may end up with a systems who need the type C to work during the boot process to see something. And that is a problem we haven't even started thinking about properly. So we are short in time. Any more questions? Somebody hand this man a, a microphone. It is supposed to be designed as durable. This is my only device. I'm not going to do a torture test on this, so. <coughs> More questions? So are you overwhelmed, disgusted? Combination of this, surprised, hungry, 
I'm rather surprised. Either I was totally incomprehensible or... Okay, um, who, who invented the spec? Was it the ACPI guys? I guess it was a kind of conspiracy between Apple, Microsoft, Google and Intel. But if, if Apple was involved, why didn't they use the lightning connector, which is not half as broken as this one? I guess because the other side was also involved. Okay. <laughs> Any more? No? Then the case is closed now.